every Kiwi knows what a white PVC downpipe looks like. And then when someone comes to put it up and they look at it and they go, oh, that doesn't look quite right. That's the time they notice downpipes for the first time, if it doesn't look right. So if you take that away and you give them the options to make it look however they want it to look in the first place, it, it disappears. Welcome to a Kiwi Original. This is episode 19, and today on the show, I'm joined by James Burns, who works for Free Flow Pipes, a company that provide and manufacture the ultimate downpipe. And you're probably thinking, what was wrong with the downpipes I've got? Well, this is the episode for you. We're going to find out exactly why uh, some downpipes are better than others. And I think, first of all, James, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Good to see you, Ryan. Good to see you too. So, free flow pipes. What's wrong with the the pipes that we're used to to take water off our roofs and into our stormwater, um, or at least reticulated somewhere, ideally off our property? Uh, mate, I can be brutally honest here and actually say there's nothing wrong with them. Um, I think where we are different and have been for the seven years that we've been doing just downpipes, um, we wanted to offer an alternative. Seven years ago, there were fairly limited choices in colour and material. Uh, every Kiwi knows what a white PVC downpipe looks like. And, uh, you know, when you've got a nice red house and you've got a white plastic downpipe, sometimes it doesn't look the part. Um, you can pay for better materials, but you'll pay a lot of money. We love, we all love copper and the look of zinc and stainless steel. They're fantastic, but they, they were quite expensive. So when this company came to life, um, uh, the, the discovery of this machine that we use enabled us to take an aluminium pipe, uh, which is fairly widely available in New Zealand. We have some fantastic aluminium companies uh, that supply products in the market. Uh, we, we essentially figured out how to make a, a, a product, a raw one-piece downpipe that you could colour any colour. So all of a sudden, the world of, uh, you know, every Dulux, Resine and, and British paints and, uh, and every paint available on the market, we could access those colours. So we could help homeowners match their joinery or their roof or their paint colour on their house. Um, so it fitted in better. So there was an aesthetic to it. Whereas right. before it was just a, a sort of, you know, it was always going to be a different colour. Um, colours and materials have evolved since then and our, our, our rivals in the market are, are pretty good at what they do and they are innovating, which is great for New Zealand building and homeowners. Um, but the colour selection is still fairly limited. Um, so essentially we can do any colour and, uh, and we make a one-piece downpipe. Our, our machinery bends a hollow aluminium tube into virtually any shape, you know, within bounds, um, which means we can make a pipe that you don't have to assemble on site. It comes pre-assembled, uh, which means for uh, plumbers and homeowners and DIYs and builders who are stretched for time, they get a they get a product that goes up really quickly. And Got it. Yeah, and, and, and they don't want to think about downpipes. No one does. I like to tell people that we sell one of the most boring building products on the planet. Um, but we make it a certain way so it's quick and efficient. And we like to think that's the plus for those guys, is that, is that uh, you know, it takes 6 to 10 minutes versus maybe 20 to 30 to assemble a downpipe. So there's some uh, labor savings. I like how you've approached it in a quite a methodical way, and, and it's not until speaking with you now that I've really even considered the color of aluminium downpipes. Like I've never, I've never considered that. Imagine what it's like for an architect or a designer. They put their heart and soul into creating a beautiful piece of architectural uh, genius in their in the town for their client, and then they have to put plastic white downpipes on the outside it's almost like when you when i see a, a nicely designed house i expect it to have you know whether it's the sky tv or the default letterbox or the downpipes so these generic things that you, you I, I didn't think you could change but obviously you've changed my perspective on that 
they, it really is. I mean, we love thinking about downpipes because it's our business and it's, and it's what we enjoy doing. And, you know, in, in normal times, we're pretty, pretty free to move around New Zealand and do our job and, and meet customers and clients. But, um, it, it, it was an afterthought. Um, you know, it's a, it's a key building element, but it's one of the last things that goes on a building. So, you know, it's a line drawing on a set of plans. And then when someone comes to put it up and they look at it and they go, oh, that doesn't look quite right. That's the time they notice downpipes for the first time, if it doesn't look right. So if you take that away and you give them the options to make it look however they want it to look in the first place, it, it disappears nicely and becomes part of the design as opposed to standing out from it. Um, and I think you'll find a lot of New Zealand companies in this, at the end of the building program, you know, fencing, letter boxes, washing lines. Yep. Still see some pretty interesting looking washing lines in the market these days um, because it's something you do after the fact and it's really down to personal preference. It's not part of the, you know, it's not integrated into the design of the house. Whereas our product can be, and if it's done right, it looks great. And then you never think about it again. If it's done wrong, it just looks wrong. So is your challenge then to take this product to market and get sales? It's not necessarily with the homeowner. It's getting the designers and the specifiers and the plans or the group home builders to include it so it doesn't detract from their overall design or construction. You, you've hit the nail on the head. That's exactly what it is. It is a, um, in the last few years, I, I've been with the company 11 months, but prior to me and, and since being there, you know, specification talking to architects and designers is key. Um, because again, until, until it goes up, it just looks like a line drawing. A designer knows and an architect know how they want it to look. No one else really thinks about it. Uh, so again, until it goes on, it, it, it either it just looks like a line drawing, so no one knows what it, what the end result is going to be. So designers and, and architects and specifiers are really important. Um, and and then as we've spent time in the market and with our good customers, and we have some really big, well known New Zealand brands who use us a lot uh, in some areas for all of their business with some of their franchises. Um, they their team then understand what the end result will look like because they're used to seeing them and they understand. So when they talking when they're talking to customers and they're dealing with customers on site and the customer says, I want this, then then they're sort of fully informed and they can say, well, you just need to factor these things in because they understand the end result. Um, so we get a lot of, uh, I guess we've got a lot of sales reps out there. We've got a lot of customers who act as salespeople for us. Um, and knowing that they're getting a good service and a good product at a good price, they then sell to their customers really well, which is great. I think what I like about it is, in, in the way you've described it, is although it's a, it's almost an afterthought in the, the historical way of building a house, it plays such a significant visual role in how someone experiences seeing their house. So for a business that's that's in the game of selling spec homes, it's quite a minor cost increase from plastic to aluminium i'm guessing in the the product side of it uh, and you get the labor back so if you if it's five minutes not 25 minutes how many down pipes would you put on a house is it is it four or eight or what's the normal oh, we, we, we work on an average of six and that's a, a really historically solid figure for any home um uh, you know obviously you have two-story homes and you have designer homes and you have spec homes and you have small compact homes and modular homes now so the numbers can vary but historically and and to this day it's, it, it stands at six um it's a pretty solid number really it's, it's quite a good way to to forecast and, and have a number that's so core to your business I and mean, then you, you you know it is what it is so it's great yeah we work with it quite well and for the the builders they can see the the sign the time saving uh what's involved up front for the designer now that they have to spec a free flow pipe versus something they're already used to in the you know the, the marley the plastic white piping what's the the training or the shift that that they have to go through to get confidence that your product does what it says it does that they know how to spec it uh, on any roof angle 
on any height building? What are all of those aspects? You have to be fairly New Zealand. I mean, I sp- I've spent three years in New Zealand prior to coming back. Uh, sorry, three years in Australia prior to coming back to New Zealand to take up this role. And I I think New Zealand is pretty good with specification, building codes, uh, industry accords, and and the rules around what you can do with building products. And the traditional approach with New Zealand-made building products is to make sure your brand is specified. So you use specification systems and companies. um, You know, Arca Pro come to mind. They're fantastic. Uh, product spec, master spec. Um, so you have to have those core uh, um, tools available to the specifiers. Um, so you need to work hard on communicating and making sure your specification is good and fit for purpose and your product satisfies or exceeds even better uh, You know the, the sort of standards put in place. And going above the standard in New Zealand should be, you know, everyone should. I know there's a minimum in place, but you really want to be, you know, if you can make a building last for 100 years, why not try? Um, and uh, and so you, you have to have those tools in place and then you have to communicate. In fact, you have to over-communicate with everybody. Um, letting them know what your product does and the name is your constant job. That's the job. Um, that is the... And that's what's happened in New Zealand, especially in the past sort of five, ten years. Alternative building products coming into an established market with established products. That is the, that is their job. That's the core of their business is to get people to know what your product can do against a rival product. Not necessarily a competitor. We're not competing. I mean, we don't compete with Mali in the way they... I don't have the, the funds and the people to fund a campaign around, you know, like Mali does, and they do brilliant campaigns and they're really good at informing the public about their product. Um, so you have to fight for that brand. You know, you have to fight for that brand recognition and putting that name out there. And that's all about communication. That's all it is. Um, there's a lot of phone calls and emails and meetings. <laughs> And so, James, you've been at Free Flow Plights for just over a year now. Was that what you said? Just, just under, just under a year. Just under a year. Uh, what, what have you achieved so far? Uh, and where do you want to take the company next? We, uh, prior to me joining, we we had some management challenges. I guess you could say. I'll be pretty honest about it. Um, the sales focus. Uh, was gone. Um, the core, your core business is your team and the people that do the work and come to work fired up wanting to do a good job and that focus was gone. Uh, and that impacted on our customers, it impacted on our supply chain, it impacted on our branding. So we're, we've sort of, I've spent the last 11 and a bit months really treating the business as a startup. Um, having some great stakeholders, shareholders, a fantastic board behind me and the team um, to sort of let us put everything back the way it should be and and regrow the business. Um, so in the last 11 months, we've, we've almost doubled our customer count. Um, we've brought some old customers back into the fold, which is a, I mean, that is the feeling every business leader wants is to, is to is to welcome a customer back after a bad experience and some of them had bad experiences I mean it happens in business and, and if you can get them back it's fantastic um, we've reduced a lot of debt um, and that that leverage given the current uh, global circumstance you know that that over leverage in business that's a that's a bad thing so we, you know, we've deleveraged in a big way. We've gotten rid of a lot of bad debt, high interest debt, um, because that money is better spent on our team and our customers, and developing new products and opening up new communication channels. That's where all the money should go. Um, and so we've we've really spent. I mean, we've really improved as much as we can. But you know, for me, I have a big thing about communication. And I always tell my guys, over-communicate with me. 
and I'll tell you when that's enough. And then I've applied the same rules to everybody else we deal with. We over-communicate, um, but we get good results out of it. Um, they know where we stand. They know where they stand. We're getting things done. We're making sure we do what we say. And so our sales have recovered as well. Um, not to the point I'd love, but, uh, you know, we've, we've put the business back in a good place, you know, good, good cost and expense base that isn't overrun with stuff we don't need. Um, and I guess we've become a bit more light and nimble in that respect. We can approach new customers pretty quickly and pretty hard um, because we know we know all of our numbers and we know what we need to do for customers. So, yeah, it's been a, it's been a really interesting 11 months for me, really interesting. That's um, I, courageous of you to, to be so honest there. And I know that's not easy sometimes for businesses to outwardly share the the ups and downs to get to the place that you actually want to get to it's not a straight line it's certainly um, not all sweetness and light Uh, over that last year taking your team through that change uh, what was one moment where uh, you thought "Oh, i'm never going to get out of this And, and what was a moment where you're like actually it's solved it's solved this is were they were they close together and what just take me through if you to recall what those moments were like. I think, uh, and and given the last three and a half weeks of some pretty deep thought and insight and research, and a lot of thinking back over my career, um, my thinking has sort of centred back in on my team. Um, I inherited a team that had been with the company a long time, knew exactly what they were doing, but had been unable to perform as effectively as they could until I, until we started giving each other some freedom to operate. And I think um, I remember the look on our administration and accounts guy, Dave, when we said, I'm going to change, uh, we're going to move to G Suite. Um for email scheduling and, and to have a, a you know cloud-based uh, a file system so we can keep everything accurate and within reach of everybody in the team. I mean, his face melted. He just he <laughs> <laughs> he'd been working with Excel and Microsoft Word for ten years. Um, but I think about three weeks later, and it was a big change. Uh, you know, to take away every system they had been using and replace it with a new one. Uh, you know, no easy task for any size business. And I've sat through systems like SAP, um, you know, Ouch. which, yeah, uh, which make life pretty interesting, uh, especially for smaller businesses. But um, Dave came to me and said, uh, hey, I've done this. And he explained what he'd done. It was, and it was a simple filing thing, a way that we could sort through files and have files accessible and he'd reorganize things. Done it all off his own bat wasn't a small job, but he did it. And I think for me, that point, just for that one guy, kind of highlighted that as a team, and it was, sort of a, it was about sort of four months in, we sort of trusted each other, and there was a trust there. You know, we're all adults. We're all there to do the best job we can. Um, and if you, if you direct people to do things and manage them, that can be a little less effective than just trusting them to, to do the job. And he'd done it. He'd done it without saying anything, done it without sort of asking or discussing it with me. He sort of just trusted that he could do it and it was a good thing for the business. Um, it was. And that was a bit of a light bulby sort of thing for me, which is, you know, if you give everyone trust, um, sometimes you fall down. But in the majority of circumstances, people actually come through and they'll try their hardest and it's for the good of the business. Yeah, um, that, that's so true. It's uh, trust entirely until someone proves you wrong, uh, I think gets you quicker to the business outcome that you're looking for in the culture than to you've got to earn my trust yeah. uh, because you're always managing for the negative. And you know, it's, I think you mentioned before we started the call, um, Ray Dalio, you know, his book, Principles on Life and Work. It, you know, it talks about those things. If you want to yeah. b- 
build the the right skills within people is to trust entirely until they prove otherwise exactly you know um and and well i mean ray dalio for a second you know radical transparency you know uh having having putting everything on the table and having a healthy disagreement with your team um I mean, good ideas don't come from people who feel they don't have trust with you and they and they don't feel safe enough to share that stuff. And, and my fear in business is if you don't trust someone, you don't share, and you're not open and transparent, they could be the person that brings the amazing idea to the table that everyone loves and takes your business from a small bit behind the scenes player to a, a leader and whatever, you know, and it's, uh, I mean, I mean, you companies that make it big and make a name for themselves and have huge success. I mean, they don't come from that. They start in the background working on something with a group of people who trust and share with each other. Um, so you've got to give it. It's hard to give in some circumstances. You've got to be, you know, you, and you've got to, there's, there's some give and take, but uh, trust is huge. It's absolutely huge. It reminds me of a story uh, that for Buy New Zealand made at the, the start of this year. I uh, got the team together uh, talking about what we would be doing for 2020. And it was a full and frank discussion. You know, at a cafe on a, um, I forget what day it was, but in the afternoon. <coughs> and we'd been talking for about 20 minutes and then uh, one of the, the people in my team said, uh, I don't think this show's working. And I'd been doing a show last year called the Provenance Marketing Show. And I was like, okay, uh, so what's not working about it? She says, well, I don't like the name. No one's watching it. And we're not getting enough products in. It's like, that's really direct. Great. What are we going to do about it? And yep. she didn't have the answer for that, but one of her colleagues started to riff some ideas well if it's if the product's not working maybe we could do interview people oh maybe we could do that well if we do people do we do that remotely and visit them or do we invite them here so we started this different conversation and within a week we'd cancelled that show and said it hasn't worked and if you look back on the podcast before the first episode of a Kiwi original, there's a two minute chat. I'm saying this isn't working. Here's why. Here's what we were trying to achieve and here's why it failed. We're going to go on a different journey. It's a different experiment. It might work. It might not. It turns out it's uh, it's working. Yep. Um, but then again, three weeks ago, I had to make another decision. Do we pause it or do we keep going? And uh, one of the things that's been interesting from the the audience is the feedback saying, I love seeing yep. into people's homes. I like yep. seeing the person and their environment versus the, the generic bland studio, which I thought looked super professional. So um, yep. this is this is version three that we've accidentally uh, kind of walked into. So on just to kind of segue from that, um, uh, where we're at now over the last three weeks, what are some of the things that you've been thinking about or how business has shifted uh, in where you're going to go next and based on what you've been doing the last few weeks during the, the lockdown as we record this uh, in week three and a bit? Yeah. Um, yeah I mean, it's. I mean, there are very few words. There are a lot of feelings and emotions about lockdown, but uh, it's very hard to put it into words. But I... I'm luckier than most. My family and I are luckier than most. And if you're not thinking about all of the Kiwis and people in the world doing it hard right now, there's, there's, there's a little bit of you missing. Like that's, There are other people who need help a lot. Um, our business went on pause for three and a half weeks just as we were about to invoice a large quantity of work to several big customers. Um, you know, we shut the doors. One of my team is immunocompromised, so he, he went home straight away. Um, so we've had zero revenue for three and a half weeks. Um, and my constant thought this whole time is not about business. I mean, it is because we have a business and that's how we, we, we all have a life. And we, we, you know, we pay ourselves money and we live and we... And we we have an economy and we have a lifestyle here in New Zealand, which is, you know, I think second to none. Um, and, and money helps that go around. 
uh, but we we stepped out of the business, and we've spent three and a half weeks uh, still communicating with customers and suppliers, um, over communicating where we can, but trying not to because there's a lot of communication floating around. Um, to try and keep those channels open and to make sure there is still trust and to make sure there's still a relationship because this is a strange time and, and you don't want to strain relationships because of something none of us can help. Um, the revenue side of things has been interesting because we've had zero, um, but we were we were just in the process of building some cash reserves to do some other things around marketing and promotion and, and products. So, again, myself and my family are very lucky, but also the business is quite lucky. We've, we've managed to, to keep up with our bills and keep up with paying all of our team, um, which is a good feeling. Um, the next period of time is, is going into level three, which for us is very challenging and interesting. Um, we can operate, but with some severe limitations. Um, there's a lot of people on building sites, and mm -hmm. to keep safe during that period is going to be pretty, you know, full on. Um, but again, our business is lucky. A lot of businesses are still on pause and still waiting to see what happens. Um, and all that talk and communication in the around the economy and unemployment and businesses failing, it's, it's you know, it's scary. Um, but for us, we're going to come out of it okay. But we're definitely going to use our time coming out of it and into the future to try and do as much good in this economy as we possibly can. Um, what do you mean by that, to do as much good as possible? Well feeling like a lucky one and feeling like our company has come through okay, not unscathed, but okay. Um, I think doing what we can for New Zealand um, is a lot of things. I mean, we operate in communities. Uh, we have a large number of stakeholders and shareholders. Um, we, we all have families. Um, my focus on the future and my thoughts on the future are now less about how do I bill as much as possible this month to try and, you know, so if we if we can bill a good amount that month, what are we doing with that money that makes sense for the future? Um, are we still trying to be a sustainable business? Um, you know, are we still reducing our packaging? Are we still trying to buy local? Are we still dealing with local suppliers and local businesses who we know and trust and work together more, as much more as we can than we have before. Because coming out of this, I mean, the we're in all in this together, we are, but you actually have to do something about it. Um, and, that, and that means trying really hard to make sure everyone around your business is good. Um, you know, if I can spend a little bit more money with a local company instead of ordering something from the States, I probably will. Um, if I can, uh, uh, you know, pay someone who's desperate for that invoice to be paid a week early, we're going to try and do it. I mean, you know, you can't make promises around that stuff, but um, you need, you need, you need to try. Sorry to interrupt. This won't take long. Subscribe to the show, and you'll never miss another one of these amazing episodes. Right back to the show. So it sounds like you're really wanting to operate in a way where you're not just doing the best thing for your profit and loss, but doing the best thing for your your extended network, whether that's your supplier, uh, whether that's how you choose suppliers, whether that's which customers and your team, which, you know, who, who do you prioritize and look after? Um, which I think is, is, is great, and you're in the position to do that. At a broader level, uh, what, what would help the construction industry as a whole uh, work better together towards some of those goals? Ooh, that is a very good question. And I probably don't have the answer. <laughs> um, I guess my feeling on that would be 
there's a very big horizontal framework for construction in New Zealand and then all of the pieces in between have their own sort of vertical operations and accords and, and guidelines and standards and things like that. Um, and then underpinning all of that, which is what how we all operate, is, is the governmental stuff, is the local authorities and things. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about speeding up consents. That's been a discussion for years. Uh, that's not a new discussion. That's just come right to the forefront all of a sudden because because the construction industry says we're going to struggle. But we've, we've been struggling for years. So, uh, you know, th- there's... New Zealand building has to evolve, has to carry on evolving. Um, new products, new ways of doing things should be at the forefront of all building companies' minds because if we can do it better, if we can do it better quality, if we can do it at a better price, we can make it last longer for less money, everyone benefits. Um, if, uh, if the cost of consent and the speed of consent comes down, that benefits everybody. Um, and it's really, like I say, I don't really have the answer, but I, I feel like the first question has to be, what is the thing or what are the things that are going to make it better, cheaper for everybody, not just a couple of people or one yeah. sector and things like that. It's, it's that sort of big blue sky question and everyone has to work to that, I think. Um all communication again, talking. <laughs> um, and I mean, government. I was, I was listening to Rob Fife this morning um, during this, saying, you know, our government it's not meant to be geared up for it, but it isn't, and, and, it, and so it isn't geared up for fast, quick, nimble action and thought. It's geared up for long-term thinking and and the the broader good. Um, but there have to be some questions sitting in. And with that, you know, what are the things that are going to do good longer term? Um, and then the construction industry and the transport industry and housing and health and education have to try and fit their frameworks to those questions a bit better. And that involves a lot of communication and talk. Yeah, and, and the you're right on the, the government speed of things. Uh, I remember seeing a, a graph and it showed just like different waves and it showed... Uh, the the speed of how individuals operate and it's like a very short quick up and down up and down up and down then businesses was like slower but still quite responsive to that individual health was more like a like a wave so things didn't change much there at all and government was almost a flat line and they're there so that they can't be captured you don't want a, a government shifting to a business or an industry entirely um, but I do think you're right. There's some bigger questions on on what we want as New Zealanders, and you know I've got my own views of that. I you know I think that every New Zealander should be able to have a roof over their heads. Like that's Absolutely. quite a, a simple thing. Uh, I think every New Zealander should be able to turn on whatever appliance they want without thinking of the power costs, including heaters. And so, as a guiding light, what if those two things? were mandated as these are values we have as a country you get a roof and you get to turn on whatever you want without thinking about it Uh, what would that mean well it would mean a lot of change we'd have to make a whole lot of new stuff new houses new construction uh new uh electricity grids micro grids so if if that all needed to be done well suddenly there's a whole lot of need for manufacturing and that's and something people. we could write and wouldn't it be great if the same people that were making those solutions also got access to the things they were making so everyone got the houses everyone got the electricity um i don't think it has to be hard uh, but it seems to be i don't know whether it's the resource management act or um, how planning is done but wouldn't it be great as if, if there was a different type of uh, legal framework for particular zones of land to say, all right, if you're a, I don't know, a farmer uh, and you've got a thousand hectares and 10% is completely unproductive, uh, unproductive, but it's near a road, uh, we'll let you sell that capital gains free 
uh, yep. only to the government. And mm -hmm. then we will give you a quarter of the sections for free. Uh, and we will build on the other three quarters and we will own them and we will provide them as houses to the marketplace. Yep. Uh, but then as soon as I say all that, I'm like, that, that goes against the whole, you know, how markets work and individuals <laughs> are a best place. But if that's the case, then I'm not sure why we don't have all these houses. Well, and that's the thing about the market. I mean, everyone, you know, you hear all the time, oh, this happens every 10 years. It's a cycle. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bull market and then it's a bear market. Um, and, if, and if the end result every time is a recession, it impacts so negatively. And this is slightly different. This, is, this isn't a recession. This is something that happened and there are a whole bunch of flow and effects and those could be huge recessions. But... If, if the if you keep doing the same thing and then you have a recession and then you keep doing the same thing and then you have a recession, something in that way of doing things isn't quite right because you get the same result every time and it's not good. Um, when you talk about microgrids and and um, and uh, everyone having access to, to housing and, and 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 turning things on in power, I mean those should be mandated almost because. With those things, um, it, you're changing the model. You, you're changing the way you're doing it because whatever we did to get here isn't going to work getting there. Um, and so, you know, with, uh, I mean, Mike, you say microgrids, and, and that's fascinated me for a long time. I mean, the power infrastructure in every developed country in the world is, is becoming obsolete. And what happens when... It's at that tipping point. All these companies that have relied and made profit from this infrastructure for so long, I mean, they don't want to give it up. Why would you? Um, but moving to a new system gives us a totally different outlook on the future. And letting go is the, I mean, it's a hard discussion because people don't want to let go. They look at things and go, well, that infrastructure is already in place. It doesn't matter. It's, it's dead, or it's going to be dead at some point. You need to start thinking about how that changes and how we replace that. Um, you know, power. I mean, renewable energy, and we're a country that has a. You know, it's almost part of being a Kiwi. Is you know, I used to love saying we have so much renewable energy whenever I went overseas, um, because it's so good. Um, but why not keep developing that? Does it not get to a point where there is so much technology and infrastructure available to do it for everybody that it actually lowers the cost to almost nothing? And then everyone has it. Um, and then the thinking around power can move to transport or health. Um, you know, a lot of smart people in New Zealand could give their time to other things and thinking about other solutions instead of how do we maintain a power network that's been the same thing for 60 years? Exactly. And if you want to reduce the price of something, the best way to do it is increase the supply. And 60 years ago, when some of that infrastructure was rolled out, there was an oversupply. Yep. So there was cheap yep. electricity comparatively. Okay. Uh, so all I'm proposing here is that we, we flood the market by manufacturing our way, way out of trouble where there is scarce supply and there doesn't yep. need to be only like less less than 20 percent of new zealand's built infrastructure 80 percent of it is is uh is blank land uh, obviously yep. we need some of that because we love our great walks i certainly like getting out into the the uh the nature and walking through the forest we don't want to, to get rid of that but th there's still a lot of um brownfield sites that could be there developed is. easily um but that leads on to a different question, which is how many people do we want? Like is, is we're at 4.96 something now, we'll be at 5 million probably within a year, maybe two years. Is that the goal or is it 10 million or 15 or 20 or a hundred? What's the number that makes the, the, the balance between our standard of living uh, which yes. can definitely go up from what it is now versus Europe or, or the US or, and our quality of life, which we don't want to reduce our access to, to the beaches and to clean waterways. It's, um, 
yeah. it's a it's an interesting interesting area. Uh, so we have got and adding, off track. <laughs> yeah, we have, but you know, I mean, and the other, I mean, adding weight to the population um, in the current climate that has some appeal. Adding people to the economy has appeal because it is money coming in and money working and people and and it's all, you know, it's, it's all building. Um, but it puts an incredible weight on the environment. And that's the other, you know, we want to become greener and more sustainable. We want products and people developing products and systems that make our country last longer and our planet last longer. Um, you know, are, the, are there some short term things that we're going to do which are going to put a lot of pressure on that? Um, you know, organizations like the Sustainable Business Network and, um, and, and any environmental agency or, or, or organization that's trying to promote more environmentally friendly ways of doing things. I mean, they're doing it with the goal of the planet lasting a lot longer, um, which is a, you know, everyone should want, <laughs> you know? Um, so you've got to, the way up of that stuff is, and like I say, you know, infrastructure where you, where you just, you decide to let go, you've got to let go of it. That's, it's gone. It's, at the time and to move on because you can make a change to a culture and a country that means you get a lifestyle for a lot longer and our kids grow up in greener pastures and with less carbon emissions and i think that's the the test of uh, have you had a good life it's leaving that legacy so that yeah. New Zealand's left in a, in a better place than you found it. My personal North Star is uh, to make New Zealand paradise, which is um, kind of a question and a challenge, which is what's wrong with it now? Uh, what, why isn't it paradise right now? And I think in a lot of areas yeah. it is, uh, and we don't want to lose that. But there are other areas and roofs over heads and unlimited power to, to get. So you're, you're not wet and you're not cold. You've got a house, you can bring up a family uh, with the, the amount of wealth we have as a country that should not be that big a deal to put it into play and make it happen. We've got the people, we've got the infrastructure, we've got the, the technology if we wanted to develop it. Yeah, and the, um, you know, the insulation scheme, uh, when we were insulating every New Zealand home we possibly could, and they were putting out numbers about the health benefits. This is the cost of the scheme, and this is the future health benefit in less respiratory, uh, you know, disorders and um, less flu and, and viruses, which is very, you know, timely now thinking about that stuff. But, um, you know, that was, here's the cost now, and here's the long-term benefit. And you sort of, and, and that's the, the constant way up. Um, but with, with things like housing and power and some essential core living things, um, you know, available to people um, easily or free, and then you think about what's the future benefit. And one of the big ones is a lot of these people who are giving time and thought to where, where are we going to live? How do I pay the next power bill? How do I get to work? Those stresses and things and, the, and, the, and that, that stuff going on in your mind can be eased. Imagine how much thought can be given to the future and to doing new things and finding pleasure in what's around you. It's a, the, the, I would have thought the mental health benefits alone in taking some of these stresses away from people are, I mean, they're priceless, really. Completely. And there are studies that say that if you're, worrying week to week about can you afford the food the electricity or where you're going to live to do the things you need to do from your situation let's say you're unemployed to uh, skills transitioning like to focus on those skills when you when you can't focus for, and more than uh, in your brain those the, the psychological side of Maslow's hierarchy of needs those ones at the bottom of the pyramid look like they're the foundational ones but that size is how much brain time it's taking up because our exactly. tribal 10,000 year ago instincts know that if we lose that, we're a goner. Whereas when yep. you're up in those other ones, if you if you don't pass an exam, look, you can sit it again next term. But if, if you don't get through the week for your rent, you might not be able to live there anymore. 
That's it. That's it. And at that time to think, oh, the, the, there are so many benefits. I mean, and that's probably been one of the only or very few silver linings in any of this for anybody really is happened. We've got to cope. We've got to find those mechanisms. And we're, going to, and we're going to do the things that we need to do to get through. But a lot of people who are smarter than me, thank goodness, uh, that are putting thought into what's next and what comes after this. How does New Zealand become more sustainable, healthier, better educated? How do we how do we make sure we have capacity in our local economy, manufacturing and tourism wise? Not to not to forego any tourism or foreign products or anything like that, but just so that we have a level of living which we all know we can achieve first. And then you can do all the other stuff. Um, and and the fact that a lot of those, you know, Rod Drury, Nick Mowbray, Stephen Turndall, Rob Fife, it's kind of reassuring to know those guys are there dealing with those things and thinking about those things because they weren't successful day one. They made themselves successful and now they're using that knowledge and that brain power that they have and that position and, and, and you know, um, hate money that they have to do good. Um, and if I more think people I, had the, hmm. you know, had the chance to do that, this would be an amazing country. And I think to, to add to that, and I don't want this to sound cynical, but I wonder whether there's a fear from any of those individuals that actually there's a shift of what made them successful. What made them success was a shift away from. So with uh, Nick Mowbray, made in China. Uh, made with in China. Uh, Rob Fife, global air travel. With Rod Drury, yep. global from day one. Whereas what I'm global seeing is, is the opposite of that, which is let's make it local. Uh, yep. We're going to have to do domestic tourism. Mm -hmm. And it's not global from day one. It's local from day one. So I think th there's been a time for, for leaders, and it's great to see them being involved. I think there's time for a new set of leaders. And listening to how you're speaking, your team's very lucky to have you. And I think uh, there's a role for you in a broader construction to actually say, well, what if we were to do this differently? Yes, we're just downpipes, but applying the way you're looking after your team and your business to a broader sector, uh, it's not that big a jump. It's not. It's not. And look, for a lot of business leaders right now, the way that those businesses have been conducted and the way they have done business for a long time, it's not going to work going forward. It's really not. And I think business leaders who are there now, if they recognize that, then then we all, there's a lot of, I, I have a lot of hope for New Zealand and every other country because if leaders do think like that, then that's good. Um, hanging on to some of the systems and financial mechanisms that got us to this, uh, knowing what happens when something like a pandemic or a tsunami or, a, you know, God forbid, another mass shooting or anything like that happens, um, you can't keep doing the same thing. It doesn't. It doesn't fix itself. You've got to change the way they do things. So hopefully, some of them are. The way they're talking is, I think, uh, uh, good. And again, it's that healthy disagreement. Mm. Being yeah. able to have the discussion and say, well. You know, this should be a priority. No, no, this should be a priority. And then figuring out the, the balance um, with sort of an overriding, this is the future of our country. Um, so hopefully a lot of business leaders are learning some lessons and, and changing the way they feel and think to, to, you know, to get us to that future, whatever it might be. And I think that's a, a great note to leave it on, James. So I really appreciate your time on on this episode of a Kiwi original and your insight, not just into uh, free flow pipes and what you're doing there, but to the broader issues that we're all grappling with at the moment and having these weighty discussions to, um, you know, lend some thoughts and maybe push someone else's thinking along in one way, or um, maybe get someone else to stand forward and be part of that next leadership team that, that gets us where we want to be in the next decade or two. Always. No, it's a, it's a discussion well worth having for a long period after this. Yeah. But thank you. It's been 
very interesting. <laughs> You're welcome. This has been a Kiwi original brought to you by the New Zealand Made team. Thanks for watching. Uh, the New Zealand Made trademark is used by over 1,200 businesses in New Zealand. Uh, the New Zealand Made team licenses that trademark. Check if you're eligible at buynz.org.nz. If you feel that someone should see this, share it with them now. Otherwise, subscribe to youtube.com forward slash buynzmade and we'll see you on the next episode.